Hello, everybody. Well, um, I'm Doug. This is Pierce. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> are these on? Yeah, they're on. So uh, I've been uh, very fortunate to be uh, just the writer. I've written about 2001 uh, a lot, but of course it's much more interesting to hear from somebody who was there during the making of the film and played an absolutely key role in it. So I'm going to just fire Doug some questions, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. So Doug, uh, you were working at a, a film company called Graphic Films in Los Angeles yeah. when you were a young man. <coughs> And you made a film called To the Moon and Beyond for the New York World Fair in 1964. Long time ago. What was the first time you ever heard of the name of some guy called Stanley Kubrick? How did that come about? Um, Paths of Glory, um, other films, and um, Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove was like a mind blowing movie. And I saw it on the wall. My friends in LA, and Dr. Strangelove was just a, a transformational cinematic experience for me. And to find out that my company that I was working for suddenly had contacted or been contacted by Kubrick about a space movie. There just wasn't any more heavenly words I could possibly hear. <laughs> So how did, how did the work come about? I mean, we're, we're particularly interested in this because you may have noticed if you walk through the exhibition upstairs that we have a great deal of material from that sort of early pre-production stage. Um, we were the recipient of a collection of materials from Lester Novros' family. Lester Novros was the founder of Graphic Films. It was his company that, that you worked for, Doug. So um, we have all of that wonderful material in our collection and we're very eager to show it off in the context of this larger 2001 um, show. So, um, you know, I, I think our, I, I would like to hear from you, and I know our audience would as, like to hear as well, kind of what that work was like. What were you asked to do in that very early pre production stage? And then eventually, how did you make it out to, to England to work with Kubrick directly? Well, there's this uh, continuity that you have to get straight in your head about what had happened, which was that this film for the New York World's Fair was shot in what was called Cinerama 360, which was 70 millimeter fisheye photography projected into a dome screen all around you, 180 degrees. And I was doing all the animation and miniature photography and stuff for that film. And uh, Kubrick and Clark saw that movie at the World's Fair, and it validated their mission, or Stanley's particular mission, to make a really good, like, a really good science fiction movie because all the other movies before that had been what we would call a B-movie, you know, monsters from Mars attack. And uh, he said, no, no, we got to go to another level with this whole thing. That was his mission. And this movie validated that that was feasible. He saw the 70 millimeter thing on a giant screen and said, whoa, yeah, we can do this. So that was a validation to me and to him that we were all kind of on the same path. So who was your, your colleagues at Graphic Films that, uh, that became particularly involved alongside you when Stanley first approached the company? Well, my, bo my direct boss was Con Pedersen, who actually joined us later. It was a little tricky because when we were working on the movie and I was doing pencil and drawings and stuff, some of which are here, about 2001 for Kubrick, I had never met Kubrick or had any direct contact with him. It was through Con or Les Nobros. And so, Kubrick decided to make a movie in London and end the contract with Graphic. I got laid off. That must have been a real blow. You must have thought I, I'm the, the, I'm, I was, I was, I was so ready to do this thing. I, I was very naive. I'd never done a movie before. So I thought, well, I'm not going to let this one go. I, I, for whatever nature I have of being precocious and pushy, uh, I called Khan and I said, I want to talk to Kubrick. I want to work on this movie. I'll go to England. I, whatever it takes. I'm God, and he said, I can't tell you, because I'm under a uh, who told you? Come con. Come he said, I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. I can't tell you anything. They had non-disclosure agreements? In oh, sure. Yeah, they've been with them. us for years. I said, Khan, come on, buddy, help me out. He said, mm, well, I can't tell you that, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that Kubrick's phone number is penciled in the corner of the bulletin board of the office. <laughs> Thank you, Con. I'm headed there now, <laughs> which I did. I went, found the number. I cold called Stanley Cooper, and I don't know who I went through, or, but I talked to him directly. I said, I've been working on your movie. I would love to continue. I'm Doug Trumbull, blah, blah, blah. 
I can only imagine something which I don't know for sure, which was he certainly would have called Khan or Les and said, who is this kid? So when and you got to England and you had that you know, fateful first actual physical meeting with Stanley, what, uh, what was your first impression of him? That he was some kind of mad genius mm -hmm. and that he had surrounded himself with a whole bunch of other mad geniuses that were visionary. Tony Masters, who was the production designer, and Wally Gentleman. So there's this whole thing. Did you remember the Universe film from the National Absolutely. Film? Absolutely, and that was yeah. famous. One of the greatest space films ever made. It's the National Film Board of Canada. Yes, it was uh, astonishing animation. Some of the, the most pioneering animation ever, black and white, but absolutely stunning. And narrated by an actor called Douglas Rain, who uh, also became uh, the voice of Hal 9000 later. So a lot of connections yeah. there. A lot of connections. But what so he, he had hired Wally Gentleman, who yeah. worked on Universe. Mm. So Wally was already there. Mm. So Wally was one of the first people I met when I came to London. So I met Wally and said, wow, this is wild because I love that movie. And he's working on this movie, so we've got a really good team starting here. And then I saw this model of the centrifuge. It was about three or four feet in diameter, plexiglass and wood model. Of the the centrifuge, centrifuge is this big drum that uh, creates the illusion that the astronauts can sort of walk around in circles. Yeah, it's right. the most impressive Artificial mechanical gravity. set probably. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was my first day out of the job. So you say that uh, your impression was standing was a mad genius. What what was the madness that you thought was there? Or the genius? That's a that's a compliment. Yeah, yeah. Um, this guy, a very driven man, talks very fast, very very smart, very astute, very knowledgeable. And I could never say anything that he wouldn't be already have thought about that, you know. Uh, and this whole idea of making a movie in space. And I didn't meet Arthur until many months later. He wasn't there every day. He was Arthur C. Clarke was the, uh, the co-screenwriter, uh, co a very right. famous uh, British uh, space popularizer and science fiction author yeah. that Stanley approached because he wanted the best of the best to help him screening, uh, to help him make the screenplay. So what was your impression of Arthur when you met him? Um, that's a hard question to answer because I didn't have much interface with him. Okay. I thought he wasn't a filmmaker. And he was more of a technical guru guy, mm. guy. And there was another man on the movie named Fred Ordway, mm. who I think was they were friends. Yeah. And Fred was also kind of a U.S. government NASA kind of representative, technical consultant kind yeah. of character. Yeah. And I didn't get along with him either. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Stanley Kubrick recruited a couple of NASA guys who worked with under uh, Werner von Braun, who was developing the Saturn V, and they were looking at future projects. And so Fred Ordway came over with a guy called Harry Langer. You say you yeah. didn't get on so well with him? It's not that I didn't get on with him. I just, I actually thought this is just too academic for me. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I, I was actually wondering when you were describing coming onto the set and um, how Kubrick, you felt, had sort of surrounded. He was a mad genius. He had surrounded himself yeah. with sort of like people. And it just seems like there were so many people that were that were real innovators, that were just like ready to sort of charge out of the gate and make their mark in a sense, that it was really this moment of invention and innovation. And I wonder how all of that went, <laughs> you know, like, was there competition among you for the best ideas? Were people working on no, things no. concurrently or simultaneously? And so what was that dynamic like in terms of the collaboration? I can only tell it from my perspective as a young 23-year-old coming on board this movie with my little cowboy boots and my jeans and my cowboy hat and my Los Angeles attitude. And um, there I am amidst all these seasoned professionals, really excellent people who have done many, many amazing movies. Very daunting and very intimidating. And I'm just trying to watch what's going on and not be troublesome. But for me, the, 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 the wonderful thing that happened for me in my life just transformed my entire career of being enabled by Stanley Kubrick to explore, take risks, experiment. The whole movie was a big R&D project. And I would have never yeah. done this before. But that's where you know, one of the gentlemen and some of the, the, yeah. the people who are not 23, some of the older people, they kept telling Stanley, well, that's not the way we do things. And Stanley didn't want to hear, hear that. He much right. preferred hearing from you saying, well, how about we try this and how about we try I was malleable. Because <laughs> <laughs> Stanley would say, you know, as everybody does something some way, that was the last thing he wanted to hear. Mm. The last thing he wanted was somebody's habit about cinematic language or close-ups or visual effects or anything. He said, if everybody does that way, I want to do it the other way. 
I'm going to find a way to do it the other way. He was very, you know, contrarian. Did you know, even from the earliest days, that you were working on something fabulous, or did you just think I, about this? No, I had a buzz every day. You had a buzz every day. I didn't do drugs, but I had a buzz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I just knew that something really special, at least for me. Mm. I felt it really special. I take whatever I'd done at Graphic Films before then, of envisioning the whole Apollo program and doing airbrush paintings of the vertical assembly building and the Saturn V rocket and the command module and the lunar module and the lunar surface was what I was painting before. This was like being catapulted into nirvana, really, to work on this movie. Because it was storytelling as well, right? It was it was sort of going from this. Um, this context where you were you were helping to sort of illustrate these things that I mean, it was amazing work that Graphic Films was doing for the Jet Propulsion Lab, for NASA, for all these yeah. companies. But it was, in, in a way, it was sort of, um, if you could say, documentary or like invent or you know imagining what space was, was going to feel like. But it wasn't tied in the same way to the kinds of um, storytelling that 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 Kubrick and company right were doing storytelling the production design. Photography, all the art forms of cinema were in play, and absolutely first rate with seasoned professionals. But and this, this, I was this very extraordinary challenge where NASA was saying, "This is what we are going to achieve in the next five years," and you, you, everybody on the production of 2001 was, was, well, we want to see what might happen in 30 years, and that that was a pretty daunting thing to try and do to actually outguess the real. Uh, yeah. NASA and, and, and look yeah. Another forward. Yeah, I, I just think we were talking a little bit earlier. I think that what happened on making this movie was a process of distillation, of trying something and finding out that it didn't work or didn't look right or didn't meet our expectations, and then trying something else and that didn't work or meet our expectations. And you keep throwing these things out until you find the one thing that actually looks good and seems to satisfy the needs of the story, while the story is changing every day. This movie was a dynamically changing R and D everything. Can I ask you? I know there's a, there are there there's so many things that you were trying to do that you were exploring that maybe didn't make it into the film. Either was cut out or wasn't ever produced. Can you talk about something that um, that that you were either trying or did and didn't make it into the final film that you wish audiences could see? Something that you wish was in the final film that is not there? Uh, no, I th not the. I miss any of that stuff, but I, it's so much, it's so satisfying to me to kn have known what we were thinking about or what he was thinking about and what was in the script and got cut out and edited and distilled. I, I, I know, for example, towards the very end of production, you were still, the, 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 the creative team was still thinking about, well, during the Stargate sequence, do we want to see... Well, don't, don't give them to get too right? much of the game away because there may be people here who haven't seen the film and I'm trying to steer away from them. <laughs> 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 well, you know, one of the, to answer one of your questions and take it all the way to the very end yeah. is that it was never clear whether he or we were going to show aliens right. at all, if ever. And there was a lot of work going on. I was working on some of the cutting edge stuff to depict aliens. And some themes were emerging that he was talking about and suggesting. He says, well, if, you, if any of you have ever seen a Giacometti sculpture, very tall, spindly, humanoid creatures with very thin arms and thin legs and thin bodies and big heads and stuff, he thought, well, that was probably a cool direction to go. And so we were headed that way. And then there was this other crazy project that Remember the polka dot man? Yeah, I've, I've seen the Polaroids of that. That there was this process that Kubrick and the photographers had worked out, which was to do a color film. This is going to get very technical, but it, you're going to well, get let's try not this to... solarization kind yeah, of thing, yeah. which is at the end of taking shots of the Hebrides Mountains or Monument Valley and turning the colors inside out and reversing positive and negative and making something blue become orange and something yellow become purple. And it was a crazy kind of thing. And so this idea was developing for the aliens. Yeah. And so the idea was that um, Dan Richter, who played Moonwalker, was going to wear this leotard, a skin-tight white leotard with black dots on it, and do contortions and dances that were abstract, 
And then we're going to take that and use this, what we call the Purple Heart Project, mm -hmm. to turn him inside out color-wise, so you couldn't see any dimension or anything other than colored shapes. But I think we could be really grateful that you didn't, because it still would have been something vaguely human or vaguely psychedelic. Well, or so. It's kind of better, the, in the end, to reject all of those and not show them. I think you're right. I'm not, I'm not unhappy with the way the movie came out. It's probably best not to show them at all. <laughs> I'm just saying that we tried, and we got close. Yeah. And I was doing stuff with video feedback and slit scan. I had slit scan aliens. There was all kinds of stuff we were doing. So it didn't make the cut because we virtually ran out of time. Yeah. Talking of running out of time, we could actually spend days, months, or weeks yeah. talking about the making of the, this film. But I think if we... If we um, can we talk about why we're still in this auditorium today? Yeah. Um, you're eternally youthful, but this film <laughs> is half a century and more old. Why are we still talking about it? What's so important about 2001? Um, I keep getting asked that question. And part of the question comes about 2001, which is like the big girl in the room. But it also comes up with Star Trek and Close Encounters and Blade Runner and other movies that have become these kind of iconic movie moments, and I'm trying to say, well, what the heck is it? And I'm trying to define it, but I would say it has something to do with extraordinary visuals and ideas. Extraordinary, not ordinary. Something I learned from Kubrick is go the extra mile, go farther than anybody's ever gone before. Put something on the screen that no one's ever seen before in cinema, and then the movie becomes unique and iconic rather than pedestrian. I mean, close, what would Close Encounters be if the mothership didn't come up from behind the mountain, you know? And so that's kind of my art form. Mm -hmm. I'm just this weird, mad scientist myself. And I, I'm part technician, because my father was an engineer in the service of a story. Well, this is it. The, the technical side of filmmaking is often uh, not as well appreciated as the, the directorial side. <laughs> and yet the technicians and the people who are inventing the ways of putting images on screen are often great storytellers too, and they're trying to find visual ways of yeah. telling these stories. Well, I'm a director myself, so I, I do it from time to time whenever I get a chance. <coughs> but yeah, the Stargate is like my proudest moment in the movie, which was a complete uh, transformation of normal photography. It took like, two minutes per frame with a weird gizmo I built called the slit scan machine. And that was all about time being becoming a component of the movie. And someone was writing about 2001, and what does it all mean and everything. And I think it was Vincent Lebrotto, oh, Lebrotto what, what, what said, it said something about what does it all mean. He said, well, you know, it's this, it's this traveling through space. And I said, no, you're traveling through time and dimension. Mm. It's time and dimension that is the core idea. So time is something we still don't understand, isn't it? We don't even know what it is. Or we don't even else. know what gravity is. Yeah, exactly. so, We've got a long way to go. <laughs> this movie is so much fun because it just opens up so many well, Pandora's box of cool ideas. Well, this is the, the key point, isn't it? The reason we're here is because we haven't answered any of the questions that are in the film. Is yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> is there anybody out there? And uh, How close we are to Hell 9000? We might find out in our lifetimes. I hope we find out in our lifetimes. And if we do, I hope the answer is, uh, is a happy one and not you know, we're going to, they're going to eat us or something. Well, if they were going to eat us, they would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they're eating us from the inside. <laughs> Debbie, you talked a little bit about uh, the, the, the Stargate sequence. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but, but um, you know, whether you do or want to talk about another scene, I wonder if there's a scene that, uh, because our audience is about to see the film in its glorious 70 millimeter glory, um, uh, is there another scene that you want to set up for the audience be before they see it? So tell them, you know, something. Oh, just a little bit. I mean, yeah. just little bits and pieces. But I would say I had this fun moment with Stanley Kubrick because I was this precocious young wannabe filmmaker learning from this master. He's my mentor. I'm learning. I'm going through this huge learning curve over two and a half years working with Stanley Kubrick. And it's a transformational, life-transforming thing for me. And I was very precocious. And it was originally scripted that Poole and Bowen, both in two pods, would go into what became the Stargate. It was actually going to be a slot in one of Jupiter's moons. And Kubrick was simplifying it and stripping it down and distilling it down to just one, so it was just going to be Bowen. And I had this flash one day. It was really weird. I don't know why I thought of it, but I said, Stanley, what about the other three guys that are left on board the Discovery? Doesn't that leave a 
horrible loose end loophole in your movie if Kier goes and never comes back and goes to another dimension. And, and he got really pissed off at me. <laughs> he said, Trouble, get out of my office and don't bug me about this crap. Until the next day, I was doing the animation of how to kill those three guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, that kind of story. That was what was so wonderful. Worked. Worked. He, he, he told guy. IBM, because IBM tried to tell him that the computers of the future were going to be these huge rooms that people work inside. And I think maybe you and, and NASA and everybody else is saying, are you kidding? Computers are going to be little boxes because they have to be small to fit in the spaceships. So Stanley wrote to IBM via an emissary. Right. You know, this is absolute nonsense. How this is crazy, the stupidest idea I ever heard. And they thought, actually, no, it's quite nice to have uh, an astronaut inside this room-sized computer. It'll look good on the screen. But he knew perfectly well that HAL wouldn't have to be that big. Yes. So that's an example of how Stanley gets angry first and then thinks, actually, maybe they're right. Well, but no, he thought he knew they were wrong mm -hmm. for his movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole idea was that those little plexiglass mm -hmm. things that come out of Hal's brain that disengage were matrices of crystal matrices of atomic particles mm -hmm. carrying information. It was like quantum computing mm -hmm. for Hal. That's what that was about. He was way ahead of everybody, and so was Arthur Clarke. And so it made sense when it just magnified a thousand times and make it big enough for an actor to be inside. Hal's brain. That's beautiful movie making. Mm. Maybe it's not literally true. Yeah. Maybe you know what's in my cell phone in my pocket is you know bigger than the, the whole Apollo mission. But yeah. um, so you have been yeah. responsible, a key player in two of the greatest, or several of the greatest science fiction films uh, that have ever been made. But let's take two of them in particular: 2001 and Blade Runner, which seem to be the flip sides of, of the possible human future. Yeah. Which way do you think we're going to go? <coughs> oh. Ask me once we get rid of Trump. <laughs> I'm very deeply concerned. Um, yeah. And uh, before we uh, go on, I think um, 2001 was incredibly physical in how it was made. And, uh, you'll see a lot of things that look like uh, computer effects <coughs> on screens and, and flat screen TVs and so on. You have to remember there was barely even color TV in those days, let alone computer graphics. That's absolutely astonishing. Now a lot of movies use computers to help with the effects. Do you think we're going to go back in, uh, to those, that mechanical way of doing things? Uh, some directors still like to have actual sets and actual physical things. Other people are just trying to do everything with computer effects. Well, my personal philosophy is to use as much organic, what I call organic and naturalistic effects as I possibly can. And that I learned with Kubrick, and I've, I've carried it on for 50 years grueling years in the face of computer graphics, which are extraordinarily powerful. I mean, we could do stuff with computers that you could never imagine. So 2001 made now would be quite a different movie. Mm. But uh, computers and algorithms for visuals are based on geometry, shaders, texture maps, and synthetic imagery trying to get photorealistic and never quite quite gets yeah. there. Yeah. So, I'm all about finding a sweet spot between the two because I use computers to do compositing of images. Like Photoshop is like the greatest invention of all time. And uh, so you can get rid of matte lines and all the flaws and artifice of visual effects has now been abandoned. Yeah. We, we can do it much better. Yeah. But if your visual effect is only as good as the algorithm of the day, it doesn't age yeah. well. But it doesn't get better and better. Really 2001 was, was really uh, <laughs> helped people think about uh, visual effects in a new way and it helped people get more ambitious and it, it invented many of the processes that we now take for granted or pioneered them. But um, above and beyond the technical, let's return to this theme of why the film is so important. What is it philosophically that still resonates with people? It's a science fiction movie about a space mission that goes wrong and it's got a slab in it. What is, is it the God quest? Is it the fear of AI? What do you think they... I think, it, I think Kubrick spoke about it in the, the Playboy interview. It was like one of the most informative bits of information mm. that Kubrick ever said. What it meant to him mm. was, yes, it's about <coughs> omniscience. It's about omnipotence. It's about something that is so beyond our comprehension that we can't even get our head around it. And he wanted you to get your own head around it in your own way. Mm. And he loved that. He loved people if they saw a religious significance or spiritual significance or aesthetic significance. He was all for any of it. 
be really honored that people would think about it from that angle. And um, I don't think he wanted people to literalize the star child or see it as you know the second coming of Jesus Christ or anything. He just wanted it to be representative of our transformation to a different level of existence. And uh, I think he did a really good job. In your personal philosophies, do you think that the universe has some connection with human existence? I think we're, we are part of it and we're from it. And I think that intelligence and uh, spirit and everything are all one and the same. And it probably pervades the universe at a very high level. I have this own, kind of my own crazy scientific philosophy, which is what if we find out the dark matter which represents 95% of what's in the universe is actually intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it has weight, and it's there, and it's everywhere. Kind of like and that. we're just little terminals connecting into a bigger cosmic web of <coughs> intelligence information. I can't say that. Well, this is the, the interesting thing about modern physics is that modern physicists are coming up with ideas and speculations like this, which sound spiritual and sound yeah. Almost religious, but they're based on their actual scientific experience. Yeah, I mean, quantum theory is really mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Quantum computing is like explosively scary. Yeah. And I think it really is that connection between spirituality and science that helps to give this film its its weight and um, helps to answer that elusive question of why we're still watching it and why it still fascinates because it does not give you all of those answers, but it sort of joins science and spirituality and this sort of quest, this odyssey um, that, we, that we are all on. And I think that, that, that as viewers, we all find points of, of entry yeah. into that. And we all find um, moments of our own questions. And um, it gives us a space to, space. it gives us a room <laughs> to yeah. sort of uh, move I, really, I thought that was really admirable yeah. for, for Kubrick to feel that he was, it was for his, his time to get out of the way. Yes. Do something and say, you just make of it anything you want and that's okay with me. And, and we are about to allow our audience to take that journey. Make up your own mind. <laughs> I want to thank you both so thank much you. for being here.